could you could you comment on the foster study? You, uh, you know, um, um, uh, calorie restricted low fat diets are not supposed to work that well, but in this study they lost like 12 kilos in a half a year, it's as much as on a low carb diet. Well, it'd be nice if they showed us, you know, what those people ate. Yeah. And you know, I'll bet you that the counseling was such that they got rid of the fattening carbohydrates. And then they managed to stick with it for a while because, I mean, they were being counseled consistently, um, you know. But again, I if I mean, it's surprise. It's funny as time goes on, people seem to be getting better at doing low fat diets, low fat, low calorie diets. But I would bet the reason they're better is because they're also changing the carbohydrate. They're doing a better job at improving, you know, the glycemic load mm. and the fructose. That's good. Diet. Is that Andreas, by the way? Anybody? Yeah, that's me. You know, Thanks. I still haven't gotten around to changing the slides. I apologize. Yeah, yeah. Time I'm giving the talk, I'm thinking, I hope Andreas isn't out there thinking. My God, <laughs> it's, gonna take a, it's gonna take a long time to change all the slides. Yeah, you know, well, they got to be shorter, and it, it'll happen before, you know, one by by the time I get to a antagonistic audience, they'll be better. Right. Um, other, uh, anyway, that's that's my my feeling with like there was an Australian study where they lost 30 pounds in a year on the low-fat, low-calorie diet. This was in the past year. And, I mean, to me, that was, you know, they said they didn't do any better. They lost 30 pounds on both diets. And it was, you know, just the fact that a low-fat, low-calorie diet resulted in 30 pounds average weight loss in a year was, like, unprecedented. And, of course, they didn't comment. They were only concerned with. And I just assume that now, because of the, all the, the you know, people know there are bad carbohydrates. So though you don't eat those, even on these diets, these low quote low fat diets. Gary, can you comment on that? You made a comment earlier on about the uh, the insulin uh, release stimulated by the by, by protein consumption. Right. Um, well, what what is the data you you have on that? Well, there's basically a, one study by uh, Brand Miller et al. and um, around 99 that people always quote where she used lean, I think it was lean hamburger meat. And she got significant, um, I mean very lean hamburger meat because she wanted to see the effect of protein and she got significant um, insulin response. So you do get insulin response both from the, the conversion of the glucose into, you know, breakdown and convert uh, the amino acids into glucose and also apparently several of the amino acids also stimulate insulin response, which isn't surprising since one thing insulin does is, you know, help store the protein where it can be used to rebuild cells and tissues. Um, but the point is we don't eat lean protein um, alone. And Brand Miller had a follow-up article a decade later where they looked at mixed meals. And when you looked at mixed meals, what you see is, you know, that basically the carbohydrates are controlling. See, because the same amount of protein with you know, with 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 fat, you get virtually no insulin response. Where with carbs, you actually magnify the insulin response of the carbs. Um, the other point is just you want to look at the long-term effects of these diets. So you look at the work that you know Mary Gann and Frank Nuttall have been doing with these low bag diets, low biologically available glucose, and low carbohydrate, high fat diets. You know, with the higher protein levels, lower um, in, you know, improve insulin resistance and lower, you know, basal insulin levels as time goes on. So when you look at over the course of weeks instead of, say, you know, hours or days, you can see that high-protein diets, you know, if they're high in fat and low in carbs, will still improve insulin resistance and, and um, you know, lower basal insulin levels. So they will, you know, decrease fat storage even if they happen to be high in protein. But again, you know, one of the things that happened over the years, because fat was so demonized, um, people started talking about these, these diets as high-protein diets. And um, I actually don't believe they should be high-protein diets. I don't think, you know, protein should go over maybe 20%. And I'm just, you know, again, speaking as a journalist and not as someone who's studied this um, as a doctor or as a researcher, but they should be high-fat diets. I think... You know, when you actually look at the evidence and just think about the the, the, the regulation of the fat cells, um, the more fat and the less 
carbohydrates and the less protein, the better. Not the you know below a point, but um, and that's hard for people to accept even now. And it's still you know like the eads and protein power. You focus on the protein because it's nobody has anything bad to say about protein, so it's politically correct. But the fact is, the fat is probably beneficial in these diets. Jerry, when you interviewed that uh, Steve Blair, he's that co-author of the AHA and the American College of Sports Medicine right. guidelines for exercise. Yeah. You know, the guy who ran like 80,000 miles over all those years and right. he was short, fat, and bald when he started, and he's short, fat, and bald and 30 pounds heavier when he ended. Yeah. Did, did, did you make any progress with that guy? No. Well, I don't. Some people I don't try. Okay. Um you know, with Blair, I didn't even try. When I asked him the question about whether or not he thought he'd be fatter, if he leaner, if he ran more, and he said conceivably. Um, right, right. You know, I, and that was actually even, that was before my book came out. So I was still hoping at that point that I could get people. It was right around, it was in a month of my, my good calories, bad calories coming out. I didn't think, yeah, I was hoping people would read the book naturally and that they I wouldn't have to you know, as you put it, make progress with them. Um, but when I interview, like I'm doing a story now on uh, the, for science on the uh, mechanistic link between obesity and cancer, and not surprisingly, it's insulin. Um, and there's a lot more known about it now than was known when I wrote my book. So, um, you know, it's fascinating. And these are people, you know, I try to make progress with. Like I was interviewing a, a Hopkins professor this morning, and it's, you know, as soon as I get the inkling that they think in terms of overnutrition causing the hyperinsulinemia and obesity, I'll sound them out to see if I can get them talking about it. 